Hello again. In our previous two lessons, we looked at the development and the structure of the Earth's unique atmosphere. In today's lesson, we're going to have a closer look at the interaction between our atmosphere and the Sun. We'll investigate how the atmosphere protects us from harmful radiation, as well as how it harnesses the energy from the Sun to regulate the temperature on Earth. By the end of today's lesson, you should be able to explain the structure, formation and function of the ionosphere, write equations to describe the breakdown and formation of ozone, describe the purpose and dangers of greenhouse gases, and conduct an investigation to model the way in which the Earth's surface absorbs solar radiation. The Sun radiates energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. Before we look at the impact of these electromagnetic radiation on our atmosphere and life on Earth, let's have a brief look at what radiation energy actually is. By now you should know that electrons are charged particles that move around the nucleus of an atom. The motion of electrons is however not constant. Electrons can change their direction of orbit within an atom. They can slow down or they can vibrate back and forth. With these changes in their motion, they create a changing electric field. Scientists have observed that a changing electric field creates a changing magnetic field. But a changing magnetic field also in turn creates a changing electric field. And this is exactly the principle on which electromagnetic waves work. The wave's changing electric field creates a changing magnetic field, which creates a changing electric field, and this process continues on and on. The distance in space between the peaks in the fields is called the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave. Not all electromagnetic waves have the same wavelength. As a matter of fact, they occur in a whole range of wavelengths that we call the electromagnetic spectrum. The waves with a shorter wavelengths pack more of a punch. The amount of energy that they deliver is great. Even the smallest amount of this high energy short wave radiation can be very harmful to living cells. It can cause cell mutations which sometimes result in cancer and genetic defects. Waves with a larger wavelength deliver less energy and are therefore less harmful. The wavelength of each wave is measured in nanometers. This is 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters or 0 0.00000001 of a meter. Look at this graph of the electromagnetic spectrum. Do you see that the waves with the smallest wavelength but the most energy are gamma rays and then X-rays? Next up are ultraviolet or UV rays. Then we come to the wavelengths that together make up the visible light or white light we see around us every day. White light is made up of seven different wavelengths. Each displays a color from violet, which is the shortest, to red, which is the longest. It's this range of colors that you see when you pass white light through a prism or when you see a rainbow. Next up is infrared radiation. It has a wavelength longer than the red of visible light. Then comes microwaves and finally radio waves which have the largest wavelengths but carry the least amount of energy. We generally refer to wavelengths shorter than that of visible light as short wave radiation and wavelengths longer than visible light as long wave radiation. The Sun does not radiate energy equally in all wavelengths. Here's another graph I'd like you to take a look at. The bars in the graph represent the percentage of each electromagnetic wavelength that the Sun radiates. About 43% of this radiation is visible white light. 7% is shortwave radiation, mostly UV light. The rest is long wave radiation, most of which falls in the infrared spectrum. Now that we know a little bit more about the sun's radiation, let's have a look at the way our atmosphere interacts with it. The sun's electromagnetic radiation is the main source of energy for us, but as we've seen, it's also potentially dangerous. And this is why our amazing atmosphere is so important. It lets in the right radiation to keep the earth at a temperature that can sustain life, 
but it also absorbs dangerous and harmful radiation. For the rest of this lesson, we will focus on how both of these natural processes happen, starting with a look at the ways in which the atmosphere protects us from harmful radiation. The Earth's first line of defense is the magnetosphere. This is a region in space created by the Earth's magnetic field. Although scientists aren't 100% sure why the Earth has got such a strong magnetic field, most believe it's because of the specific chemical composition and movement of the Earth's molten core that acts almost like a dynamo. The magnetosphere protects us from the solar wind. The solar wind is a stream of high-energy charged particles that results from solar activity. These high-energy particles are even more dangerous to life forms on Earth than shortwave radiation. The magnetosphere acts like a protective shield and deflects the solar wind. Our next defense mechanism is the ionosphere. As we've mentioned in Lesson 1, this isn't really a separate layer of the atmosphere. It's rather a name given to a region of the atmosphere that starts at the top end of the mesosphere and extends throughout the whole thermosphere and is given a special name because of the activity of the particles in this region. The sun's electromagnetic radiation hits the outer atmosphere with great power. We know that radiation conveys energy. This energy comes in packages of specific amounts, just like you can only buy sweets in specific sized packets. The special packages of energy that are carried by electromagnetic radiation are called photons. Photons at short wavelengths are capable of knocking out an electron from a neutral gas atom or molecule. This happens when a photon collides with a gas particle. The photon is consumed in the collision, which means that the incoming solar radiation is partially absorbed by the gas atom. The products of this collision are a positive ion and a free electron. This process is known as ionization and it's exactly what takes place as the high-energy shortwave solar radiation hits the outer atmosphere. Are you beginning to see where the ionosphere gets its name from? That's right, it is called the ionosphere because it is the region in the atmosphere where ionization takes place. But the ions and electrons can't and don't exist on their own forever, so ionization is not the only reaction happening in the ionosphere. Gas atoms or molecules also recombine. If an electron moves close to a positive ion, it will be captured. We've seen previously that the atmosphere's density decreases dramatically with altitude. This means that even though at high altitudes the solar radiation is strong, the gas density is low. This results in a low amount of ionization. A photon must first find a molecule or atom to collide with. There are more gas atoms and molecules present as the altitude decreases. Therefore, more ionization reactions take place. But, at these lower altitudes, more recombination also happens. Recombination happens more frequently at lower altitudes because the gas particles are closer together. Interestingly, the ionosphere is divided into layers not based on the amount of ionization taking place, but on the electron density and types of radiation absorbed in each region. Let's look at a diagram to understand this more clearly. The ionosphere is composed of three main parts, the D, E and F regions. The F region stretches from 150 kilometers to 1000 kilometers altitude Electron density is highest in this layer. This layer absorbs ultraviolet radiation. The E region is found at about 95 km to 150 km altitude and contains mostly O2 plus ions. This layer absorbs lower energy X-rays. The D region from 75 to 95 kilometers up has relatively little overall ionization due to its position at the bottom, but it absorbs one of the most energetic forms of radiation energy, high energy X-rays. 
On a more practical note, the D and E regions reflect AM radio waves back to Earth. You may have noticed from the diagram that the auroras form in the E and F regions of the ionosphere. What exactly are auroras and what makes them happen? The special way in which the particles of the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field interact sometimes creates a flow of electrical charge between the magnetotail and the Earth's poles. High-speed electrons whiz along the Earth's magnetic lines towards the poles until they are pushed into the outer atmosphere. Here they collide with the gas molecules present in the ionosphere. These excited gas particles then release energy in the form of light and this is what we observe as the auroras. Let's continue our examination of Earth's defenses against solar radiation. You may have heard the buzzword ozone layer. The ozone layer is the last and most important defensive layer in our atmosphere. Ozone is a form of oxygen. Its three oxygen atoms join together as O3. Ozone is less stable than diatomic oxygen. It has a very important job of absorbing ultraviolet radiation in the stratosphere 20 to 30 kilometers above Earth. The concentrated band of ozone that forms in the stratosphere is called the ozone layer. Solar radiation is responsible for making ozone and for breaking it up. Let's take a look at these two reactions carefully. An oxygen molecule absorbs UV radiation and splits into two oxygen atoms with unpaired valence electrons. We call these free radicals. We write the chemical equation as O2 plus HV reacts to form O plus O. The two oxygen radicals can then react in three different ways. The two radicals can reconnect to form diatomic oxygen. The radicals could connect with a diatomic molecule of oxygen to produce ozone. Or the radicals could also react with an already existing ozone molecule and two diatomic oxygen molecules would result. Once an ozone molecule has been created, it can absorb more ultraviolet radiation. As ozone molecules protect us from ultraviolet radiation by absorbing it, the molecule is broken up again into diatomic oxygen and its radical. It is very important that the creation and destruction reactions of ozone should be balanced. The amount of ozone in the ozone layer should remain about the same. But of course, not all the sun's radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere. We know this because we feel the sun's heat and see a sunrise in the morning. Let's have a look at a diagram to see how much radiation is absorbed and what happens with the rest of the radiation. This will help us understand how the atmosphere keeps the temperature of Earth at a reasonable level. As you can see from the diagram, 6% of the total amount of solar radiation is scattered by the atmosphere. A further 20% is scattered by and reflected of clouds. Only 19% is absorbed by the atmosphere and clouds. Approximately 4% is reflected by the Earth's surface and the remaining 51% is absorbed by the Earth. This radiation is absorbed by the Earth's oceans, land and vegetation. As the Earth's surfaces absorb incoming solar energy, the Earth becomes warmer and can then radiate energy back into the atmosphere. This radiation from the Earth is called terrestrial radiation. It is important to understand that because the Earth can never get as hot as the Sun, the energy carried by terrestrial radiation is less than that of solar radiation. So, the Earth radiates energy in longer wavelengths than the solar radiation it absorbed. Most terrestrial radiation falls within the infrared spectrum. So, during the day the Earth warms up nicely, but the problem is at night the heat gained could radiate back into space and Earth would freeze. Luckily for us, outgoing terrestrial radiation is absorbed by certain gas molecules in our atmosphere. The gas molecules consist of more than two atoms bonded loosely enough to allow the whole molecule to vibrate. 
These are the greenhouse gases. They absorb the infrared radiation, vibrate, then emit the energy again. Another greenhouse gas molecule then absorbs the energy. The cycle of absorption, emission, absorption of energy is what keeps the Earth at a reasonable temperature. Nitrogen and oxygen molecules are too tightly bonded to vibrate with infrared. Carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane and nitrous oxide on the other hand are examples of greenhouse gases. So although the topic greenhouse effect has a negative connotation today, without heating the atmosphere in this way, life on Earth would be impossible. Disturbing the fine balance in the atmosphere that protects us can be disastrous to us and our environment. Are we looking after our atmosphere adequately? We will consider this question in the next lesson. Before you go though, have a look at today's task. Design an investigation to model how different surfaces on the Earth absorb solar radiation and radiate out heat. For the investigation, you could measure the temperature of water in different colored containers when they are left in the sun for the same amount of time. Then you could also measure the temperature of water placed in a clear glass container above different color surfaces. Yeah.